This is Jeffrey Fox again, your fearless instructor of big data applications, analytics, machine learning, etc., and clouds and everything else that's uh, driving the next uh, generation of the economy and science and everything. This um, particular set of slides discusses the data deluge, namely the big data side of the equation. And it looks mainly at the uh, first at the area of so-called cyber infrastructure, which is really big data for um, scientific research. And then it looks at the particular aspects of artificial intelligence and how they're application related. That comes from, from recent uh, analyses of the internet trends, that's Mika and Gartner. And uh, say cyber infrastructure is our initial set of slides. And we will also uh, use work that we did for NIST in this area. All right, let's get going on data value B. Thank you. Well, s similar things. So cyber infrastructure is an old name from NSF. And it means distributed, it means the infrastructure that supports distributed research and learning, which is the same thing roughly as e-science, e-research or e-education. And the cyber infrastructure links data, people, and computers. Remember in the 2015 uh, Gartner report, we were talking about in digital business linking uh, to things and people. You know, the business will link to the things and the people. And so this all proceed. This definition preceded things and the computers of laptops and supercomputers and things. And it uses the Standard technology, Web 2.0 and clouds, and it adds uh, possibly using the grid, although that's now a little old fashioned, management, security, and supercomputers. Uh, it, it adds actually all applications to in science. It supports parallel computing, which is for low latency uh, between nodes, and distributed systems with high millisecond latency, where the low latency <coughs> for tightly synchronized parallel simulations, and the high latency is for distributed data and loosely coupled uh, processing. And uh, for parallelism, we need to do data decomposition. We gave some examples of that already. And um, the distributed is particularly relevant for things like biology with distributed gene sequencing or environmental science, even more dramatic distributed sensors. And uh, cyber infrastructure can be used for almost everything, from the video conferencing to the design of a new battery, uh, analyzing the world's telescope data, looking at personal genomes, looking at tweets, looking at the stock market, looking at the spread of disease. Uh, looking at language, ranking institutions, and so on. Cyber infrastructure is just a general term which is just usually just infrastructure in the commercial world. All right, e-science, which we can generalize to e more or less anything. I used to like e more or less anything. Now I find it uh, it's not so interesting because that's that's gone. A few years ago, this was a really hot area, but it's now well understood and not so hot. And this uh, e-science came from John Taylor, I don't know, 20 years ago, 18 years ago. And it's all about, again, electronically enabled science. So using cyber infrastructure to support science. Um, and that's why these tools and technologies would be called cyber infrastructure in the US. And they need to do better, faster, different research. We will give some examples. And e-business is, of course, what uh, got the called the digital business, linking businesses, people, uh, smartphones, uh, Alexas, and so on. And they say, we can think of e more or less anything from Digital libraries, fine arts, having fun, that's probably the most lucrative in education. And this all corresponds to a deluge of data, which you have to manage and understand, process. And uh, you need to link people, computers, data, and that data is sensors, instruments like 
all the way from giant instruments like the CERN accelerator to smaller instruments like the environmental sensor on a, on a bird or something. And we need to link them with hardware and software networks. Okay. So here is a rich slide describing the Large Hadron Collider, which is it's a whole bunch of magnets accelerating protons and antiprotons. And that tunnel is 27 kilometers in circumference. And they have experiments where the uh, particles in the, in the tunnel are allowed to collide. And then the fragments from the collision, which can be a thousand particles, are then analyzed in an apparatus. This apparatus is shown here for ATLAS. Uh, CMS and ALICE and LCHB or other experiments. Not, uh, CMS will be as big, the other one's not quite as big. And it's giant. Look, here's the people working on ATLAS. And there are actually 3,000 people on a single experiment. 175 institutions, 38 countries. So this is surely what people call big science. And then we need to take the raw data which is actually um, triggered. If we don't take all the data, they need to do a strong selection for data of interest. We take the raw data, which is the measurements, like here, some raw data, which is actually a Higgs boson. And it's, kind of, it's measured in this giant apparatus with things that detect energy, things that detect photons, things that detect charged particles, and their, not only their direction, but also how much they bend to be able to calculate the momentum. Um, every event is essentially independent. They're linked together when you do an analysis and see where unusually large number of events are and so on. And nowadays LHC is 50 petabytes of data per year. It didn't used to be that size. And I, I say sometimes they just switch off the LHC. And years go by when they upgrade it. And the LHC computer grid does the initial Analysis, which is the largest part of the process. And that 200,000 cores, at least there were a couple of years ago, in, LH, uh, in the LHC computing grid. And they have tiers, uh, which are just ranked by where they are. Tier zero is CERN itself, where the data is taken. Tier one are facilities in Europe or England or, or um, US and tier two are regional facilities. You can have any number of those. Um, so it, here's some numbers. CMS, a different experiment to access with similar, has seven tier one, 50 tier two, and it, man, it succeeds in getting all those people to work together. Here is the uh, first of a couple on astronomy. We have just here um, pictures. Here's the square kilometer array. And uh, these are all in different wavelengths. Here's the classic uh, large telescope, Mount Palomar. There's also the telescope in the sky, Hubble. And here's the Sloan telescope, which is aimed at producing more data very fast. And it's meant to cover a wide range of topics. All right, here's some multi-wavelength astronomy. And here you have the same region of the sky taken in different wavelengths. Actually, the prettiest is probably the visible, where you can see this beautiful galaxy. And if you look at it in different wavelengths, far infrared, radio, visible, x-ray, dust, dust map, galaxy, you get these dust maps and galaxy density maps. So this would require higher resolution data. Okay, here's the next one, Polar Grid. This is a collaboration, Indiana, Elizabeth City State in Kansas. Uh, we have uh, data taken by aircraft, by towing them, like we see here. And that data just looks down into the Earth and looks for snow layers. It looks for glacier beds, that has to go kilometers down. 
that data is then sent off to polar grid um, sites in uh, Indiana, Kansas, and Elizabeth City State. Here's the lab at Elizabeth City State. Here's a pretty frozen looking um, wireless device, I think. And uh, they build those sleds in Kansas. Everything gets shipped by our favorite shipper, FedEx or UPS. And here it is being dragged along. So this is sort of contributing to climate change studies and by very directly finding out what mapping the glass is. Here's another one, an example from uh, NIH, the gene sequencing cost. And here's the cost of sequencing gene. The first one cost 100 million, and nowadays they're a thousand dollars. And <clears throat> this plot shows a contrast with Moore's law. Moore's law hasn't had any revolutions, but around uh, 20, 2007, there was a revolution and the cost of the sequence of gene dramatically decreased. Now it's more or less leveled off at about a thousand dollars. Here is a sort of access chart, which is particularly useful for science. I call it 5A, because Bob Marcus had a five. And here we have what happens in the field. Sometimes the data comes in like this, streaming in from directly from the field. Other time, <coughs> like in the Crucis one, it gets, gets stored on local disks. The disks get flown by aircraft from uh, the North or South Pole and to Indiana University. And uh, so we do this local accumulation until that, that accumulant gets big or full, and then you send it back to, to copy off and we send these to, this back to, back to the Arctic. Here's an interesting um, curve highlighting an important issue which will come out at from several points of view. Here's called the long tail of science. <coughs> And that says there are some fields like particle physics, that's the LHC, astronomy, the S square kilometer array, and LSST, and here's biology. And these are plotted about, um, these, are ha these have a few experiments, each of which is uh, very large, that's this up here. And, and then we have over here, we have the long tail, economics, social science, some biology, where you have individuals gather doing lo lots of experiments. But they've not got a lot of people involved and not a lot of data. So we have a few large data things, and then we have a lot of small data things. A lot of small data is the so called long tail. Long tail is very suitable to clouds because clouds are very effective at analyzing lots of things, each of which is not so big. They're not so effective at analyzing individually huge things because then you need to use parallel computing. And for some things like search and recommender engines, parallel, uh, clouds are very effective parallel computing engines. For other things like clustering, they're not so effective. Um, <clears throat> so this is this type of graph is also seen when you look at books sold. There are a few books which sell an enormous amount, and lots of books which sell a small amount. And now if you run a physical bookstore, you sort of cut off here. Now you only have space to hold this. And the person going to the physical bookstore never sees this. This is why the internet allows, um, it's sort of more democratic, it allows the long tail to be accessed. And using recommender engines, you can actually suggest which part of the long tail people should look at. Pretty interesting. So here are some um, data intensive activities. Uh, from my point of view, I gave you the fellow, the, the Teradata, fellow Francis view, particle physics, which is a bag of events. Information retrieval is a bag of words. I'm trying to point out there's always a space attached to each of these activities. E-commerce, a bag of items to be sold, or users trying to buy things. Social networking, a bag of people with links and properties. Health informatics, a bag of health records, or a bag of gene sequences. Census. Lots of pixels, bag of pixels. And these applications here use statistics, deep learning, image analysis, recommender engines, or anomaly or outlier detection. And they do this on cloud. So this slide here really gives you a nice example of a rich set of fields 
in a different set of spaces with a range of tools all running on clouds and they're using variants of MapReduce. And this comes to our famous summary of the uh, course, the big data ecosystem in one sentence. We're using clouds, we're running data analytics, we're doing it collaboratively, all working together, we're processing big data, and we're solving problems in X informatics or EX. Uh, <coughs> and uh, EX informatics is a superset of X analytics, and here are the values of X we discovered on the web. And we noted there's some like physics, which weren't actually defined. We hadn't used the term informatics before, but should. And of course, we're doing data science. And uh, that's what this course is all about. And it's uh, an exciting new academic area, which captures all of this. And here is the final slide of this, uh, this lesson. Remember, this is lesson two of unit two. And this is from the web, what I collected here, these Definitions where I found people had introduced the concept of exinformatics before. Originally, around when I first came to Indiana University, I taught my first class called exinformatics and got attacked because people said it's, it's not a good idea. And then I stopped until um, I stopped for about 10 years and gave up that course. Oh, well, I mean, you know, sometimes you have good ideas and you have them too early or you give them up too early. You're too sensitive and so on. Here we have earth science informatics, pathology informatics, lots of other <coughs> medical informatics here, health, health uh, informatics, biomedical informatics, medical informatics, um, biochemistry, cheminformatics, science, biology, and so on, bioinformatics. Um, here we have uh, energy informatics. Lifestyle informatics, which isn't quite the same lifestyle as I use it. Uh, but it's, at least there's a university in the Netherlands that can study that. Environmental informatics, and a much bigger field, social informatics. All right, there we are, informatics and ex-informatics. You can get rich, you can just cure cancer, um, do whatever you want with ex-informatics. And all you have to do is learn a bunch of algorithms, buy a few clouds. And you're home, you have everything you need to do to do X informatics. And of course, you better get a degree in data science, because that's the qualifications. So here I am signing out of lesson two of unit two, the motivation. Thank you. All right, fellows, now we come to a different section, uh, only loosely connected to the previous section. It is on the implications on applications and the revolution we're discussing, the data knowledge of artificial intelligence and deep learning. And as we were stressed over the last um, almost only three years, AI has emerged as the core technology. Uh, previously it was used and called machine learning, but now it's um, mature, much more mature, it's quite obvious it's a success, and it is in some sense replaced clouds and and big data as the core technology. And if you look at that field, you have um, many sort of almost now um, legacy systems, such as those from the big commercial companies and also Spark. Uh, those have machine learning often built around well-known um, toolkits, um, but uh, like SkyKit. But um, and those are pretty. Re those are actually good at the lower end when you don't have large uh, large data and sophisticated applications algorithms. But if you go to a complex uh, machine learning or deep learning, which is probably the most complex, and at least in terms of compute power needed, then you uh, those have for huge advantages, which have been shown, especially in language translation and voice recognition and autonomous uh, vehicles, and um, obviously NVIDIA has made a fortune from this. Part of its fortune is Bitcoins, the other part of its fortune is deep learning. And then of course it has its main business, um, gaming. And then there are a whole set of libraries which are mentioned here. CNTK from Microsoft, TensorFlow from Google, Cafe from Berkeley, and the uh, other systems mentioned here. 
these are software packages which run on a variety of different hardware, some more general than others. Well, here's another sort of look at AI from the fact of now many companies say they're AI companies. There was a time when Microsoft and Google announced they were mobile first. Their effort was trying to direct their business to the smartphones. That's because today smartphones have overtaken desktops as the leading interface to the Internet. But if you look today, you will find those companies no longer, they're still focusing on smartphones, but they're now AI first companies. Their positioning in AI is what they think is going to determine their success, not their positioning in the mobile world. That's probably good for Microsoft because it does screwed up the mobile world. But, um, and they're actually very good in AI. And here are just various uh, quotes from the, I grabbed from the web about, uh, which have AI. Um, where people of Google, Twitter, etc., are buying up AI startups. Google, Facebook, and Microsoft are remaking themselves around AI. The These are just from 2017, so they're relatively recent. Google, the full stack AI company. AI is fueling Amazon's success. Microsoft says AI is the ultimate breakthrough. Um, Tesla has an AI guru who will make his cars more, more attractive and powerful. Netflix is using recommender engines, which is their application of AI to conquer the world. And also there's some bandwidth issues. I mean, Google is remaking himself as a machine learning first company, which is the same thing as an AI first company. Because machine learning is sufficiently vague, it basically describes all major AI approaches today. And GE, is, which has got the industrial internet of things as a major Product uh, area where it's putting on instrument, uh, putting on, putting sensors on all its uh, uh, appliances from air, air refrigerators and um, um, air conditioners through aircraft. Uh, it is it has got a huge focus on the AI to interpret the signals from those sensors, and of course they all have to hire people, and of course our Intelligent Systems Engineering Department is AI first engineering. So we are sort of happen to be aligned with this trend. Let's now have a little diversion based on a trip I took to Microsoft at the beginning of August, where they had a so-called faculty summit, which they have every year. Uh, this was hosted by Microsoft Research in um, Redmond and um, Microsoft Research over the world has about a thousand researchers. It has 800 interns. Many students from Indiana University go there each year. And uh, that particular faculty summit I went to was focused on their uh, computer systems activities, which were on systems for AI or AI for systems. And there is a link to it. And I found uh, not, not the deepest talk, but the most inspirational talk was the overview which was given by the director of the Redmond Research Lab at the end of the conference, where he defined the concept of the global AI supercomputer to effectively define what this amalgam of big data and continuous ubiquitous clouds it really is. And uh, this global AI supercomputer links the intelligent cloud to the intelligent edge. And here is a link to this fellow's talk. All right, here's another very good, I mean, given the amount of people they have in Microsoft, I think they could have drawn a better picture. It has a various cloud, private and public, various uh, networkings, and also various edge devices. And um, that's the amalgam that we're trying to Capture with the intelligent edge joined to the intelligent cloud. And um, here's a little more data. The intelligent edge is where the data is collected. It's where the actual actions are taken. Um, where the, the, the you actually have the software, including AI software, at the edge, which is making decisions. Sometimes that software goes just goes back to the cloud and um, basically transmit what the cloud decides. Alternatively, it actually does the computing at the edge, 
which is necessary you want that uh, decisions that we make quickly. If you want to say more, if you want results uh, quicker than a couple of hundred milliseconds, it's probably wise to do it at the edge. Because by the time you screw around, by the time you transmit the data, screw around, invoking the cloud, it's not so easy to get the results back less than 200 milliseconds. And um, so the edge is low latency. It is actually reasonably secure because usually each device is on its own. It is not shared, whereas the cloud is a shared device, multi-tenancy, multi-tenanted, and so it is less secure or trustworthy. However, it has the advantage of totally infinite computing resources of all possible types. And it also has access to the entire world's data, at least in principle it does. So it's got all the data, all the computers, but it's a bit slow and stodgy. And so you have these nimble edge devices connected to the universal um, mother of all computers, the intelligent central cloud. And we, when we talk about the global AI supercomputer, we're imagining linking everybody's clouds together. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and so on. And that's, that's um, defined here, the global AI supercomputer. It's a giant machine. It's, uh, that's what you look at it, it's just everything. But inside it's got lots of little things. Particular computers with particular amounts of memory and particular accelerators. And of course, the users look at the giant supercomputer view, and the system researchers try to arrange all these, all these uh, parts together to make them run effectively. Okay, here's a pit, that same lousy picture with a circle around it to show that the global AI supercomputer has joined everything together. And it's so it's important to note the AI supercomputer is not just the cloud. It's the cloud plus the edge. And the cloud and the edge are equally important. And the edge, the cloud edge effectively does cloud-like computing, where it's called the fog. So you know the cloud, cloud is continuous. It goes from the center to the edge, and you just have different. As you could get nearer the center, you get more powerful, and we get access to more data. As you go to the edge, you just have a much more focused computing environment and a much more limited set of data. So it's a reasonably clean situation, which is not likely to change because it's almost inevitable given the cost of networking and things like that. All right. So here is some of the examples of work to be done on. In by the systems researchers, people like me, and uh, of course the more distinguished people in Microsoft and Google and so on. They, uh, they were building AI for big giant systems, big data systems. That's a critical feature of our research in uh, intelligent system engineering. To do that, you need to be able to predict how much work things will take and may make decisions about which job to run where. Uh, there was a focus in this particular meeting on AI to control the AI supercomputer. So the supercomputer is itself running AI to make the supercomputer more super. Um, you have specialized software. You have the concept that in today's world, actually software is not the only way of programming. You can program with data, because when you train a system, that's effectively the equivalent of what used to be done with software, and you do that with just getting training data. So software 2.0 is training data as software. Um, we have to um, build systems for AI, and we do that with software, sophisticated software, also customized hardware, and everything is all mixed up and optimized in all possible ways, because everybody is linking to each other in all possible ways. So that's it. That's why life is exciting. Then we have all these cosmic questions, how do I program it? What is the user interface? What can I do with it? Which is, um, we're getting lots of examples of that from the world today. And uh, the other, maybe more important question, what can't I do with it today? which I should now work on so it can be done tomorrow. Security. For some reason, students don't like security often. But it's obviously critical. The US government and companies think security is critical. 
and a lot of resources are put into that area. So, what can go wrong? The machine can be attacked from all possible sides. There can be people in the middle occupying it. They can be spying on you. And uh, how do you look at the security from all points point of view and add them all up? And then there are these re regulations such the European Union just put into place about rules about data and use of data. And then we have to see whether this machine is compliant. And then you have to prove that you're compliant. These are important, if not quite as jazzy as making, uh, building a, a convolutional deep learning network. All right, the next uh, few slides are just sort of snippets from the um, Mika Internet Trends 2018. Uh, here they've focused on just some of the offerings of Google, uh, where they have a, um, a cloud vision API. Uh, to do vision, computer vision. They have, they've actually moved into the hardware business. They've built their own uh, tensor processing units, which are very good at array operations, because uh, if you look at the heart of machine learning, it's usually uh, linear algebra, which is manipulations on vectors and matrices. And tensor processing units have been well known to be very powerful for that. And actually, this type of acceleration has been, it's been around since the 1980s, when I started parallel computing in 1980, there were many people looking at not exactly the tensor processing units, but units are motivated by the same idea that motivates the TPU. Uh, we have uh, a user interface, an AI, remember that was one of the Gartner um, emerging technologies. And uh, we have uh, cloud machine learning, which um, automatically uh, produces models and trains them for you. So that's the Google AI platform. And here is sort of amusing um, record of all the things that are going on in the AI area as a function of time. And um, I, you know, actually, when did we do this? Around 85, we actually competed, and I, my research group competed and did very badly in the World Computer Chess Championship with a, one of the first parallel computers, mainly handicapped by the unreliability of the computer. It, would, it kept breaking on us. But we did build a very powerful parallel computer chess program. Anyway, we got much, that, that field of matured very quickly, and there were all these uh, various um, uh, entries that were all from the USA, and China didn't compete in those days. Then we have a soccer simulation league, RoboCup 99, where they had Europe and um, USA. 2005, we had an image processing thing where China competed, but not very successfully. And then we had uh, another major AI competition where Google and CMU, difficult to imagine a more powerful combination. And China, um, with Microsoft's collaboration, uh, or actually was in the took places two, three, four, and five. Um, so Alibaba, of course, is uh, China's answer to Amazon. So China is an emerging um, force in this area, and they have big government initiatives, actually larger initiatives than the US has. Although the US has a big focus on AI which has replaced many of the previous focused efforts. Um, and here are some comments from uh, Eric Schmidt, and um, which says basically that China might catch up in five years. And um, I also note that Japan has a big national organizer. But so competition, like I would say that the nations are gonna be competing in AI. And that's going to be the battle of the next 10 years. Not necessarily battle, but that's going to dominate the headlines of the capabilities in AI. Um, so this is um, China's uh, efforts. And um, they're building AI systems. They want to look at smart cities. They have a big effort called uh, Made in China 2025, which is building AI or AI 
controlled machines, some so-called software, um, software-based uh, machines, and uh, they're, they're trying to integrate to be an intelligent society. Uh, they have obvious military applications with commonality between the civilian, say, uh, civil defense, um, crisis management rather, and military command and control. Um, both of those need very similar capabilities. And they all need uh, secure and a very efficient uh, infrastructure. This uh, pervasive infrastructure must run the global AI supercomputer in an effective fashion. And these slides point out that this global AI supercomputer is actually probably a national AI supercomputer. Each nation will have its own supercomputer, maybe each company. But I suspect companies in a given country will tend to have some collaboration. So this is a pretty um, exciting area, and uh, I anticipate enormous progress. Just we'll keep watching these areas of the how people judge that progress in AI. So that's it. We're finishing the AI part of the big data introduction, data deluge. Thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox signing off on Lesson 2B.